Hi, this is Lex, and welcome to the Fintech Blueprint. It's your podcast about fintech, decentralized finance, digital banking, investing, robo-advice, artificial intelligence, and all the other frontier technology that is transforming financial services. To get more content, like an illustrated transcript of this conversation in your inbox, subscribe at fintechblueprint.com. So without further delay, let's jump into today's episode. Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's conversation. I'm really excited to have with us Sean Bennett, who is the co-founder at Stronghold, a really compelling fintech company that we'll talk about. And we'll talk about applications, infrastructure, and the building of technologies in general as well. So with that, Sean, welcome to the podcast. Thanks very much for having me on, Lance. My pleasure. I think one of the treats for this year for me is just meeting new people and learning about new companies. And I think this year is really revealing the kinds of companies that are able to stick around, generate value and have sustainability and sustainable advantage. And so I'm excited to double click on Stronghold and learn more. So let's start with a bit of where you come from and how you come to this industry. You know, and in particular, I was really interested in, you know, the beginning of your career where you were working as an independent software developer, because a lot of people have much more traditional paths. It seemed that you really explored how it was possible to build technology, and that kind of led you to entrepreneurship. Can you open those up for us a little bit? Like, What were your early experiences building software? You know, early on for me, building software started off as, as more of a hobby, a way to fund myself through college. So originally, uh, I was planning on attending medical school, and that's indeed what I did for uh, about three and a half years in New Zealand. And through that time, you know, as well as going to lectures and going to labs and, you know, making sure I was progressing on that front, I was spending a lot of time building software. You know, I, I jumped on those online platforms, you know, Elance before it turned into Upwork and was, was just building software for clients as, as a contractor. What really engaged me with that was the ability to, you know, quite quickly turn thoughts into my, in my head into, you know, actual deliverables. That was, that was super exciting for me. And the ability to, you know, not not just be building exactly to spit, but be able to, you know, put my own own spin or, you know, treat it as a bit of an art form is what really attracted me to that. And I, I think that over time, what I realized was I was less and less interested in, in going down that traditional path of becoming a physician, right, which was, there was a lot of rote learning. It didn't really give me space to be able to, I felt at least, think for myself or to go out there and, and build solutions to problems that I saw out there in the world. It was a, a little bit too, you know, focused on on a single thing. I loved a lot of, a lot of the patient interaction in, in that piece, but I, I did feel a little bit boxed in. You know, I think that I wanted to start tackling, right, as I'm sure a lot of, you know, entrepreneurs see all those problems out there. But the big one that I was always interested in was remittance growing up. So as a, as a young person growing up in New Zealand, my mother was Filipino. She would send money back to our family back in the Philippines. And, you know, 10 years ago, very, very different to today with, you know, Western Union and the, the rest of those companies, transfer wise, very, very uh, digital focus these days, but back then very manual, much more expensive, huge delays, huge, huge costs for what really were small amounts of money. I, I thought there has to be a better way of going about this. And we've seen that we, the timing coincided with Bitcoin coming out and then, you know, some of the, the advances in the crypto space from there. So that's really what took me from, okay, I'm I'm seeing these problems. I know how to build software. Can I go and have a stab at, at some of these things myself? Quite naively, right? To to think that I could I could do something just as an individual, but it was that that's how I started off. Just just start building technology and, and see who I can meet in the space. So so that's really what what took me off. One of the things I wanted to just push on a little bit more, because I think it's probably informative for how you might think about the world is what is it like to be a software developer that works on a lot of stuff versus one that is working on you know a dedicated project like no normative judgment on my end about 
like working on a big project versus working on a lot of projects. Especially because I think when you are working on many projects, you're sort of acting as somebody who's running a business with the clients being people for whom you develop the software. And then at some point, when you have your own company, your own sort of tech startup, you're running a business where the development of the software is in the service of the end clients, the end customers. And I wonder like, what you're, again, kind of going to that foundational experience of having the folks that you write software for be your clients. Were there any learnings there? Were any patterns kind of come up? And maybe any contrast to having more ownership through the entire product development process? It's a great question. What I really loved about working for multiple clients at once and having a lot of projects in the air was that it, it, it really taught me to balance my time and focus. That that, that seems obvious, but it, it also meant that I was getting exposure to a lot of different problems all at once, and I had to very quickly be able to understand their particular context, their industries, so I could build the best solution for them. And so even though I was doing, I started off more on the contractor side, and about two to three years after kicking off, I was more doing consultative work. And some of that would lead to starting off actual development, and sometimes I would then be handing over to a team. And I think that that, that early experience really transitioned me really well into coming into you know my own startup and my own business. Even though I now work in more of a, hey, here's one industry or a couple of industries we might interact with and here's your context, I think that my mind a lot of the time is more thinking about the client than it is sort of sitting inside the four walls of strongholds or you know whatever I happen to be working on. And I feel like in some of the space in, in crypto, Generally, it, it feels like the, the, the thinking is more just on the technology or, or whatever the project happens to be. But for me, it's important to, a lot of the time, be thinking in the, in the client's shoes and, and just building for them. And if that means that we're changing our product or we have to do something dramatically different because it will benefit that client a lot more, so be it. And so that's the thinking that I brought through from those early years. Consulting and services work as training for product people or for tech entrepreneurs is really valuable, especially because you start to shorten the time it takes you to ramp into new spaces, whether that, you know, it's industry problem or business problem or some marketing psychological behavioral problem. Like if you're constantly exposed to slightly different fact patterns, after a while you start to isolate the method by which you can actually get to some sort of conclusion and take action. And I think it's, if you have a high velocity of being presented with these issues and, and having to deal with lots of diversity, it's actually really, really productive. A lot of the times it feels like 80%, 90% of the solution is exactly the same. It's just nailing down that, you know, 5%, 10% that is very specific to them. And that's where you're driving a lot of the value, but you're not, you're not spending all that time figuring out how to do the bulk of it. There's a lot of cookie cutter that you can that you can run with. You said that you grew up with remittance as like a family use case that was really important to you that you saw the power of. And then you started in your technology work to come across crypto and that led you towards, I assume, Coinex. Can you talk a little bit about sort of what happened there, what was compelling to you, and what were the early hypotheses that you had? Sure. So it was, you know, 2011 is when I came across Bitcoin. And I remember seeing it when it was used as a, a donation vehicle to WikiLeaks. And that was, it was actually my first year of medical school. And so I was, I was interested in the idea of programmable money. I played around with it. But because it was, it very much felt a different currency, it didn't feel like to me to be the answer to, you know, the remittance problem that my mother had. When Ripple or OpenCoin finally went to open source their ledger, now called the XRP ledger, that's when the sort of the coin dropped for me because, you know, what they were proposing at the time was putting sovereign currency, so, you know, good old US dollar, Australian dollar, New Zealand dollar, whatever it happened to be, on top of blockchain technology. And it was at that point I thought, okay, this is something that I'm, I'm going to jump head first into because it, you know, to me, that solved the problem of ha having that, you know, disintermediation of, of the transfer, 
but it was still a currency that people knew and understood and you wouldn't have to have the exchange problems. So it was really that 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 made me decide to jump into the space. And so that's when I went ahead and started CoinEx, which was a stable coin issuer on top of the Ripple network. And so I issued those three stable coins, US dollar Australian and New Zealand. And there were other stable coin issuers on the network. So essentially you could on-ramp your funds in one country, send them to you know another off-ramp, wherever that happened to be, Philippines, for example, off-ramp, and get the, uh, the funds to that person a lot more cheaply and fast. So it, it was really the, the tokenization aspect that got me excited about the particular technology. You were painfully early to both stable coins and programmable money, right? This was 2015-ish? Earlier than that, actually. So uh, 2014, and I, start, I kicked off at the, right at the end of 2013. So pain, painfully early, too early. Can you define in that moment what to you an off-ramp was? Like, was it a bank account that you would open up in different geographies? And so you kind of like transfer wise balance between the bank accounts. Was it some sort of payment rail merchant relationship? Like what were the on and off ramp mechanics? And then for your, for your point about stable coins, I'd also like to understand, you know, the word is so magic now, stable coin, but you know, what it meant for you at that time as well. Yeah. So on, on and off ramps didn't, looked a, a little like exchange accounts or, or they looked more like wallet accounts do today. You know, R- Ripple had this overlay which was taken down as they changed strategies, but early on it was like a, a single wallet interface that had connections to all of the stable coin issuers that happened to connect onto their ledger, right? And these issuers included actual exchanges as well as, you know, digital wallet providers or dedicated issuers like what I was running. And so you would you would sign up for the service and there were a few other alternatives and essentially just connect in your, you know, credentials for the actual on and off ramps. So I, I guess the closest would be, you know, you could think about like an, an Apple Pay where you have to, you know, connect your individual cards, although it was you're, you're probably going to get money in and out of a bank account. But that, that's how the interface worked. This was in the Ripple network, is that right? Yeah, ba- ba- back in the day. So this, I think, existed until maybe mid-2015 before a, a change in strategy. Although it's interesting to see that they're actually pushing stable coins on their ledger once again in the last you know, year or so. So, so that's how the on and off ramps worked. And, and stable coins here were almost all the same. They were one-to-one traditional currency backed money sitting in a bank account. No one's doing any sort of, as far as I was aware, no one was doing any sort of investing or, or anything from those, those assets. It was just plain money in depository accounts. And you would interact with the stable coin. Everyone was been minting and burning by sending or redeeming money from, from those bank accounts. These weren't really stable coins that were getting you know, traded, there wasn't DeFi. So the, the, the usage of these was, was much more simple back then. The token was a claim on these pooled fiat accounts. And so it's like inserting a token into the transferwise flow. It would be hard to predict at that time that these assets would become not money movement mechanisms, but actually financial instruments for holding cash inside of portfolios, which is a you know, very different use case. So how did that go and how did the hypothesis work out and kind of what did you take away from that to your next experience? From a technology point of view, it was all, it was all good and well. Early regulatory landscape was ill-defined. Certainly there were some obvious hurdles to overcome like AML, KYC, and you know, whether participants on the, the network, so the other stable issue was implemented that was you know, sort of 50-50. Uh, so, so that made things a little bit difficult because of you were almost, you know, I think it was clear that, that these services fell under those regimes of regulatory oversight. And if you subjected yourself to that, you couldn't interact with parts of the network that didn't. And certainly parts of the network felt that they weren't going to you know, come under that regulatory oversight. So, so that, that was a big challenge early on. One of the other challenges was just getting user adoption. There were a lot of, a lot of players on the network who were just like me, very, very technology focused. Marketing was poor. No one knew how to really acquire users without too many, you know, pathways open. 
you know, just the ability to send money anywhere in the world wasn't realized. There were very, very few actual corridors you could send money through. So I think I think the whole thing to me, in hindsight, felt like a great proof of concept for how the technology worked. The best thing I got out of it personally was connection into you know, some of the organizations that were running there as, as well as getting connected to Silicon Valley because at the time I was still, you know, in a college town in New Zealand. So that's what I really got out of it. Quite quickly, I think everyone realized, all the, the businesses who were early on there, that, hey, this is, we're not going to make revenue doing this right now. And so things started winding down and I wound down Coinex mid-2015, I think. I want to move us over to the next founding experience that you had how did you get into that? What opportunity did you see? And what was the thread? It sounds like you saw the need for KYC for regulatory compliance and things of that nature. Did that kind of light a new light bulb in your head? Or how did you get to your next company? So while I was running CoinX, Jed McCaleb left Ripple and started Stella, right? And, and it was a fork of Ripple at the time. So the, the Stella network exactly the same integration, at least in their first version. So the day that opened, I launched my stablecoin issuer on the Stellar Network. And so I was the very first issuer there. And that allowed me to form some relationships with them and, and some people at the organization. And so their first head of growth was Tammy Camp, who was now my co-founder at Stronghold. So that's how we met. She essentially was my you know, partnership manager over at Stellar. And so we, we worked together there and it was clear that we had very similar ideas in terms of what we wanted to achieve. And, you know, remittance was one of them because both Stella and myself were in, was interested in that. But the, the underlying thing we realized was it was, it's, it's basic access to financial services for all, which is now the stronghold vision. After I wound down CoinX in 2015, I, I continued doing consulting work in Australia. Late 2017, there was a lot of, a lot of investment, VC money was starting to move into crypto. And it was at that time, you know, Tammy, and I reconnected and we thought, okay, now seems like a great time to go ahead and tackle the vision that we both clearly had. Tammy had been working in VC herself, you know, actually raising money from, you know, LPs. So she was raising money for the funds, as well as working with the founders of the startups that the money was being deployed into. So she some great experience that she's taken through into Stronghold and some of the things we're doing now. We went ahead to start Stronghold. It was a lot more crypto focused originally, but we were, we were actually going to tackle international payments as, as one of the first things we were looking to do. And that compliance piece did very quickly become a, a very, very core aspect of Stronghold that remains to this day. And so, you know, originally it was compliance around international payments that was very similar to, you know, what I'd done at Coinex and what Tammy knew from, from having worked at Stella. You know, you've got your, your cross-border KYC, your, your FinCEN, your sanctions, all, all, all that good stuff. And I think that because we were doing that still quite early on before a lot of other players were catching up to the, the fact, I would, I would like to say that, you know, this sort of technology falls under that, those, those regimes – that we got some of our early deals. And the, the big one for us, the big unlock, was partnering with IBM to help build and power their blockchain worldwide network, both giving them technology to integrate with Stellar as well as actually creating the US dollar settlement stablecoin that would go in their network. And of course, all the, all the compliance that came along with that. So I think that for us, having that key differentiator early on was super important in making sure the company got that solid foundation. And that continues through to today where we're doing slight, a slightly different thing. A lot of our products and payment volume is domestic on ACH rails, right? Traditional payments. But the core of it is compliance burned in industries. Uh, so being able to, you know, work well with banking partners and other payment processes and auditors is, is actually a huge part of our business today. So I think that for us, keeping an eye on, you know, where we think the regulatory world is going to be looking two or three years ahead was was key. And I, I don't think that the space ignores that now. It certainly did four or five years ago. It's quite compelling that your work on early stage technology and trying to engage with Ripple as a crypto payments network and with the idea of stablecoins and 
encountering the regulatory resistance has actually opened up for you this appreciation for banks and for infrastructure and for powering things up in the right way. Because I think a lot of people, you know, they like rage quit. Like, you know, you didn't choose the easy path, right? Building on Ripple or Stellar or for IBM is harder than at the time building for and on, you know, Ethereum or Polygon. What was your internal process to lean into that? Like, yes, more of this rather than do the more trite kind of anti-establishment, anti-government screed? Like, how did you process the pushback and the developments in a way that led you to want to get better at this? You kicked off the podcast, you know, by by talking about, you know, opening the new year and thinking about the players that are able to stick around. And it's, it's easier to think about in hindsight, but I, I think that one of the things that, Tammy and I have done best is position stronghold to make sure it can stick around. And there's a lot of different factors there. You know, the, the way we approach our financial side, right, in terms of our, our, our ongoing focus on revenue means that we haven't had to, you know, lay off a bunch of people recently. That, that also extends onto, you know, what, what, what you were just asking about now. For us, we've always seen our products more as an extension of what our traditional customers want and we're going to give them more functionality, not scare them with a complete overhaul with all of of all of their systems. And that's because we we felt it was important to target existing transactions and, and improve them, not to try and carve out a new segment of the market and give them something where it felt like they were moving their transactions over into a new system or we're trying to get new fund flows to use it. And, you know, that that's kind of what I, I did at Coinex, right? Yes, okay, these, these money flows were existing. They were remittance customers. But the people that were, the customers that were likely to use Stronghold were going to be people that, that they, it wasn't going to be the same audience that was using Western Union at the time, right? Going to as my mother did a post shop and, you know, walking up and physically handing over some money. So, you know, that was that was a, a big learning back then. We're not going to get the revenue that we need anywhere near fast enough if we have that approach. So for us now, it was very much going to customers and presenting them with something that didn't, didn't necessarily look like it had crypto behind it. And as I say, a lot of our transactions go over ACH today. We use a blockchain network to, to ha- have some funds and accounting move around, but it's, it's, it's quite traditional. So that was super important for us. That makes sense. And I think it's a good time to open up Stronghold and define what the company does. In particular, I think this relationship between your wanting to focus on payments and an embedded finance story, like a payments infrastructure story, but at the same time using blockchain tech underneath I think the way that you're mixing those two is quite interesting. So I'd love to to hear more about that. And I think it also reflects the shape of demand that you're talking about, where with CoinEx, you're going after basically two probabilities, you know, people that are interested in trying out the Ripple network and also people who are trying to do remittance, right? You multiply the probabilities, you have a very low market. Whereas I think, it, as you realized, going after existing demand with just a solution that is better is much more powerful. So I know this is quite a leading question, but I think if you could open up what Stronghold is, how it came about, and then this relationship between the value proposition and the positioning to the customer versus using blockchain tech underneath. Our vision is to be able to provide accessible financial services to all. And we want to achieve this by bridging between the worlds of, you know, the traditional payment network and sort of reaching into the, the new innovative space, blockchain, crypto, to kind of grab grab the value that exists there and then bring that back to our customers who feel a lot more traditional. Right. That that that's sort of the way we think about it now as opposed to giving giving them the you know the innovation directly in their face. And so, you know, we're a payment processor, we provide our infrastructure via uh, APIs, our channel partners, our technology providers who are building, you know, point of sale systems, e-commerce solutions, and pushing them down into their merchant base. 
So when it comes to, you know, checkout, strongholds, payments are in- embedded in there. And our focus is on compliance burned industries. So, you know, ones that might have problems using traditional processes or, or, or getting banked for a variety of reasons. You could think of age-gated industries, alcohol, licensing problems, gaming, gambling, cannabis, those sort of things. Those are the spaces in which we excel because of our strong you know, compliance aspect and our, our own banking relationships. And so you know, the, the way we, we go about it, thinking about that bridging into the blockchain or, or crypto world, our, our customers use our traditional payment systems. A lot of the time that's ACH. We do have the ability to process cards as well. But when they want to use some of the other solutions that we provide them, those might happen to be powered by by blockchain or, or DeFi. And the one that has the most demand is our merchant cash advance product. It's essentially an advance on their payment processing volume. So it, it's, it, it looks a bit like a capital loan. And, and these are customers that would not be able to access these in the traditional world at all, right? Because of the, you know, aforementioned banking problems. So, th- so this is really us living the vision in real time, being able to provide these companies that are otherwise discriminated against with the capital they need. And we're able to provide that by using DeFi on the back end. So, you know, the, our customers are logging into what looks more like traditional banking software, making applications for their cash advance. They're receiving the money just in their bank. They haven't had to touch a, you know, a crypto wallet, MetaMask, anything like that. But on the back end, we can power that through DeFi lending pools, right? We're able to write a certain amount off our own balance sheet, but we need we need help in, in providing the capital that our, our customers are demanding. And so we've sort of got one foot with our customer. It looks traditional. The other foot can be very, very crypto-focused, right? And so we're, we're able to have, and today it's, it's a private group of investors investing into lending pools. You know, they're using MetaMask or whatever tooling they, they want to use, fully crypto on that side. They understand where the funds are being deployed, totally fine. And then we, we sort of administer and, and bridge the funds back into the traditional world. So that's really how we think about those, those two pieces now. It's taking me a bit to connect the dots because you've got three things here kind of going on in the positioning and it's a bit unusual. There's one thing which is commerce payments processing, right? So when I look at your site, I've got lots of stuff for merchants on checkout, like rewards, real-time payments. So that tells me when you think about your customer, you think about merchants or platforms that have merchants and have like e-commerce flows. Number two, you've mentioned merchant financing. So that makes me think about sort of the prepaid revenue SaaS type underwriting that we've seen in a bunch of fintech companies, you know, last year where it's another revenue source and you're doing digital lending and you're underwriting based on the quality of that revenue. And then, you know, separate and apart from that, I've seen IBM blockchain and you're talking about DeFi. So it's quite novel to try and combine all these things. What's the mix of these things together? Like, how do you prioritize? How do you make sense of it? For us, the core is payment processing for our our merchant customers, right? And that's really driven through the channel partners who are building the solutions. The the extent to which we, we look at these other things really is just what... How much do we need to engage with these other spaces like DeFi to provide the value back to our core customers? In terms of the, the product that is getting the most demand, we don't feel like we're inventing the wheel there at all. You know, Square Capital and their, their financing product, which is, is merchant cash advance essentially, is, is where they make you know a, a bulk of their revenue. And so when we were you know looking at the space, we had we you know pulled their uh, finance documents that are public, and we saw that, we thought, wow, okay, this, <laughs> that, that's how they make their money. Why aren't we doing the same? We have a captive audience of customers who can't access that product any other way but really through us. Let's offer it. Okay, great. Let's start that off. And we started you know, writing that directly off our balance sheet, which is you know, thankfully possible for us because we, you know, we're focusing on revenue, so we had the ability to do that for a while. But how do we grow that? Okay. Can we go and get traditional funding ourselves? Not for this space. Makes sense to go into DeFi and, and get those investors that aren't so concerned about where the money is going 
and are looking for outsized returns, which we can provide in the space because, again, our customers, they don't have any other option. And so it was really just to the extent we needed to do that, that we need to focus on that piece. So it, it doesn't feel like, hey, we're focusing on A, B, and C. We've got a sole focus on our merchant customers, but we had to sort of reach out and extend you know, our arm out into that space to grab that value to bring it back to, to our merchants. So that's really how we think about it. How international is your merchant footprint from a geographic perspective? That has changed over time. While previously we had merchants in, I think it was about eight countries, right now we are 100% focused on domestic US. And we had to make the tough decision to close off some of our contracts. It would have been early 2020 around the time COVID hit. And that was just a self-preservation measure, making sure that we were prepared for whatever whatever was going to happen there. So 100% domestic, but we are looking to expand in North America in the coming year. I wanted to just follow up on the, the underwriting and the DeFi. On the underwriting decisions, what kind of data are you using that flows through to help you make sense of, you know, if a particular merchant is a worthwhile risk or not? And then, you know, what are some illustrative rates that the merchants borrow on? Sure. So in, in terms of the data we collect, you know, the, the obvious one is we process payments for our customers. We're able to see that at minimum, we know, you know, on average, how much they're processing, you know, week to week. The bulk of our data, though, really comes from the compliance burden piece. And here's where com- compliance and, you know, the struggles of onboarding merchants and compliance heavy industries actually becomes a, a blessing in sort of disguise again. Because we have to go, we, we have to make our merchants jump through hoops in terms of providing us financials and extra disclosures and ownership documents and, you know, the whole gamut of onboarding when they come on board with us for payments. It means that anything we do with them subsequently can feel sort of low documentation because we've already done it, right? Or there's already a cadence of them having to update us with, with certain information. So we're able to pull from that to, you know, make our underwriting decisions. So we have, you know, access in, in, in most cases to what they might be doing outside of just the payments we see with them. So we have an idea of, okay, what proportion of their total payments is, is processed through Stronghold and we can extrapolate that. You know, we have tax records that we're able to look at as well and we can look at ownership and previous history of, of owners. The good news from from our point of view, back to our mission, is we won't necessarily see things as red flags that traditional players will. Like, you know, previous convictions, we, we're okay with a lot of those depending on what those are. You know, even tax problems in the past, fine. We, we, can, we can look past that and just look at recent history. But it is the ability to use that information that makes our underwriting a little bit better than just looking at the payments that go through our system. It's quite interesting because there are often very similar problems that digital lenders have that emerged out of peer-to-peer lending. So Lending Club had the same issue, OnDeck had the same issue, and they solved it in different ways, which is once you get to sufficient scale, actually peer-to-peer doesn't work, and you do need just a source of capital on one side. And that source of capital can be private equity, it can be hedge funds, it can be high net worth individuals, but building out the funding source for financing your risk is like a different business than building out the the underwriting practice and you know generating enough leads that need to be underwritten. I think it's quite interesting and novel to try and use web3 investors as a funding source for traditional companies. Can you talk a little bit about like which chain you're using and what sort of protocols and then you know again going back to like the shape of the asset class like what kind of returns are being generated? So in, in terms of protocol that we're using, we're on Ethereum for this particular piece. I think that that sometimes surprises people given our history on, on chains like you know Ripple or Stellar and, and even where our own token happens to sit on Stellar. But we, we need the ecosystem in terms of you know tooling, wallets, other you know other lending protocols or sort of library contracts that exist on Ethereum and the fact that basically everything settles and clears through there anyway. It was an obvious pick for us to to go and sit on Ethereum. We're not high transaction volume on the lending side in terms of a lot of transactions going through the network, so we we didn't mind Ethereum and the costs associated with that and, and block times. It, it was fine. It seems like the safest, most intuitive pick for us. If we were to ever decide to open up to retail, which 
is something we could consider later. Maybe then we would take another look at things. But, you know, just sticking on, on the private institutional money side, Ethereum was a great choice. Returns for us are interesting. We, we do not have an interest rate on the merchant side because it's a cash advance. It is not a loan. While I can't talk to the returns that flow back through to the lenders, I can give you some indicative interest rates to the merchant customers. So what we're seeing there is you're seeing late tens to early thirties in terms of what their effective interest rate ends up being. And that it does feel quite high, but the impact to our customer is immense in terms of what they're able to do with that capital. And that is acceptable to them. And they, and they love it and they keep demanding it, even at what might sound like quite a, a high effective rate. So, you know, obviously you can sort of think about what we're able to return back to our, our lenders given, given those relatively high numbers. So the way I read it is actually really encouraging because you've had this early life experience of being fast to on-ramp different customer problems and then the experience of building out crypto dedicated software really sort of using crypto or alternative crypto networks for their own purpose and then in building out stronghold which is a business focusing on commerce and merchants and their set of needs it sounds like web3 and and the existence of web3 is just another tool it's like you know if i want to design a website i'll use css if i want to access capital i'll use defi because that's where modern capital is and in many ways that feels like the best place to be like that's how we should treat at some point web3 as just a digital source of funds in the case where you want it and i feel like somebody who might have not had the background that you did in trying to build a crypto remittance business wouldn't have even thought that that was in the toolbox that's exactly right, or would have spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to quickly implement it into the business. For us, the actual process of implementing MCAs, ex- excluding how we went around underwriting, ha- happened in the matter of days for us. And so we were able to prove it out without feeling like it was we were losing our focus. And very quickly, that MVP showed in- incredible returns, and, and that's when we built it into a, a full product. Yes, it, it helps power our product, but also just being able to experiment on that really quickly, you know, very fast feedback cycle, that, that was the real power that, you know, both Tammy and I got out of our backgrounds and bringing that into Stronghold, I think. You have a tool in your toolkit that others don't, and that gives you a lot of power. One kind of last thing I wanted to just ask you about are the trends in commerce that you see emerging now. You know, we've gone through this COVID cycle, which created a huge boom for digital shopping, and everybody thought that behaviors would permanently change with customers preferring the, the sort of like Netflix, Deliveroo, Amazon, Neobank, Revolut world forever and ever. And that went up and it went down. And although there is an underlying growth curve that shows adoption of e-commerce continuing, it feels a little bit like a slowdown relative to the recent peak. What have you noticed in this world, in the e-commerce world? Like, What are the trends that you see based on software that you provide and the customers that you have? Well, it's, it's absolutely impacted our product decisioning. Our major focus right now is back on in-store experiences. Because, you know, a slowdown, absolutely, a, a decline, absolutely, in terms of e-commerce. Every, you know, people are, people are wanting to go back and store. They want that experience again, it seems. So for us, improving our digital in-store presence and flows is, is one of our big uh, key pieces. And, and the other one is loyalty. We're finding that our customers, e- even more than before, want that whole experience around you know, the brands that they they like. And I think, you know, a couple of years ago, they were going to brands that were easier to get to in the middle of a pandemic. And now they're, now they're ready to go back and travel to places that they actually love. So that's another key thing that we're looking at. So in-store and loyalty and customer engagement. That's That's what we're really focusing on right now. And that's where we see the next three years at least. Really interesting stuff. And I think quite insightful for how people should relate to technologies as tools to solve problems and wrap those solutions around the current market reality rather than necessarily get religious about the political things that they stand for. If our listeners want to learn more about you or about Stronghold, where should they go? 
I'd point them to Stronghold's uh, social page, stronghold.co slash social. All our links are there. Sean, fantastic to have you. Thank you for joining today. Thanks very much for your time, Lex. Hi, everyone. That's it for this week's episode of the Fintech Blueprint. For more technical deep dives into all things fintech and decentralized finance, check out fintechblueprint.com and grab a free subscription to the newsletter. This is Lex, and I'll see you next time.